abrirle a estas compañías eh, nuestros datos es como dar una concesión para una empresa minera sin pedirles nada a cambio. Eh, porque los datos son el, el oro del futuro. Ve Google, Facebook, Amazon, eh, Alibaba dice, bueno, no, eh, estamos eh, en sus manos. The 20th century had white collars and blue collars. Yeah. It had brick and mortar stores and brick and mortar jobs. But then came our digital revolution, and it has disrupted nearly every conceivable marketplace. The technology in that elegant iPhone has created millions of jobs and destroyed millions of others, and for the moment has left the majority of us scrambling not to be left behind. Lo primero que busqué en Facebook, todo el mundo hablaba de Facebook. Me creé mi cuenta en Facebook y me creé mi cuenta en Instagram, en YouTube, en todos lados. I'm actually seventh generation coal miner. I wanted to end the seventh generation with me and become my boys being the first generation of coders. This new economy isn't about white collars and it isn't about blue collars and it certainly doesn't own anything in pinstripes. So lose the tie and find the hot spot because this is our digital world. Disruption creates winners and losers. As digital automation is becoming more prominent, factory jobs in the developed world are vanishing before our eyes. Maybe somebody will throw us out, maybe they won't. Let's go. Mark Klimo worked in the Bud Power Plant for 32 years, until it closed in 2006. So there were certainly 12, 1,300 people working in that building. And this was uh, the late 70s, actually. 2003 was the end. That's when they started to rip out everything uh, that they hadn't sold already. They really stripped it out, though. The only thing they left, really, was structural stuff. And that's not looking too good either. Yeah, there were a lot of a lot of people working in this building. If you look at manufacturing jobs in the United States, uh, when I was a kid back in the 1950s, they were about a third of the workforce. This number has steadily decreased over the last 60 years, and it's down now to about 9%, percent, eight or nine percent of the workforce is in manufacturing. It's hard to blame technology, but we are tremendously efficient at increasing productivity in the manufacturing industry. It just takes far fewer people to manufacture the same amount or more goods. In 1980, um, it took 29 people to create a million dollars in manufactured goods output. Now it takes 6.5 people. Digital technology has made millions of jobs obsolete, but it has also created millions of opportunities. Here on Africa's southeast coast, new tech breathes life into the economy of one of the world's poorest countries. In these cases, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. What matters is access to technology. <laughs> Developing skills for the future is one thing, but digital technology can help maximize the efficiency of traditional skills and capabilities. When you realize that there's only 700,000 formal jobs for 27 million people uh, currently, you, you can imagine you know, how many people are out of a job. UX is a leading software startup in Mozambique. Their Biscate app allows workers to create profiles for their skill sets and to match with potential customers. It's like Uber for the informal economy. And it's a major upgrade over the traditional ways of finding work. So basically what you do is you get on the app, you select the profession that you need. Let's say you're in need of a carpenter. You select the place where you're at and then you find a list of, of carpenters within that place uh, and, and you find ratings from other customers. Antonio Macandal is a carpenter. I visited his house on the outskirts of Maputo. This table is a table made of material recyclable. 
Sim, tudo que tem aqui. Everything. Everything is here. Yeah. Até a minha própria cama. <laughs> Antonio is an informal worker who has benefited from Biscate. Today he's in luck. He's matched with a client on the Biscate app. We head into the city to fix a broken chair. Hey, hey, what's up? Big job to bring more money, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Federica Ricaldi monitors the program for the World Bank. Normally they just use informal networks. Uh, they know people who know people who might know a, a worker on the area. Um, through this uh, platform they can also rate workers and the work that has been done. And so there's a possibility that also their total demand for these type of services uh, might increase. But you don't have to be a World Bank specialist to recognize a satisfied customer. The digital disruption sheds jobs and creates jobs. And during this transitionary phase, the old way and the new way are caught in a tug of war, familiar around the world. Few cases demonstrate this as clearly as the dynamic between taxis and ride-sharing apps like Uber. Well, the competition, we illegal and illegal. Porque eso no, no, no pagan las cargas sociales que nosotros pagamos. La licencia que tenemos nosotros que vale, hoy en día es algo barato, pero vale unos 140 mil pesos. Y ellos no pagan absolutamente nada para poder manejar en la ciudad. Te digo la verdad, me gustaría quedarlo a palo, pero no se puede, no iría preso. Uber is technically illegal in Buenos Aires, but it exists. Uber functions only in cash to mask transactions, and drivers ask riders to sit in the front seat to mask intentions. The taxi union is fierce, and the courts have been pretty strict with Uber. It operates as sort of a phantom company. It has, you know, more than two million users in Argentina. It operates in a real twilight in the system, popular but essentially illegal. Hay zonas en las que definitivamente no podemos parar. Te encierran, llaman el resto de taxistas, te, te dañan el auto. Por eso no lo voy a poner acá. Los taxistas eh, ven una competencia. Esa, la ventaja de la tecnología, cuando vos lo vas al principio, es esa, la que da Uber. La seguridad para el pasajero y la seguridad para el conductor. Our digital transition has happened so fast that policymakers can't keep up, and it creates opportunities and anxieties recognizable around the world. Incluso ahora están poniendo robots a manejar autos. Eso obviamente nos complica mucho a todas las personas, no solo a taxistas, sino a miles de personas que van a perder por el trabajo. The government reaction to the digital transformation changes depending on the country. For an aggressive, top-down approach, we visit the world's largest democracy and second most populous country. Over the last 20 years, digital technology has spread like wildfire in India. Over 1 billion SIM cards have been issued for an estimated 700 to 800 million phone users. Between 300 and 400 million smartphones have been activated in India. But instead of over-regulating the industry, the Modi government has doubled down on digital, betting heavily that faster connections will lead to faster development. Chief among the government's initiatives is an effort to create a biometric identification system for its 1.3 billion citizens, or as it's known in India. The Aadhaar. 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 The Aadhaar National ID. This is a program that you spearheaded That's and right. it transformed India. The idea was that the government of India spends a lot of money in social welfare programs, tens of billions of dollars, and a lot of that does not reach the intended beneficiary. So the starting point was how do we ensure that welfare and social benefits reach those whom it is intended to reach. India did not have a strong birth registry system. Half of India is not registered for birth, uh, at, at birth. So that actually means that there is no root document in this system that can prove who you are. So Aadha took a very new approach to say we will use the biometrics of the individual to actually stake their own identity claim. 
India is digitizing rapidly, but this raises the critical question of access. Back in Dharavi, I found an encouraging level of digital penetration, especially among younger residents. Internet is also a very cheapest thing for, uh, for us. People cannot afford iPhone, but they can afford a China phone, you know. मतलब हम लोग को अभी कुछ भी जानकारी चाहिए रहता है तो अभी हम लोग डायरेक्ट नेट पे सर्च मारेंगे गूगल क्रोम पे तो डायरेक्ट आंसर मिल जाता है दे कॉन्ट बी ए स्टूडेंट दिस गवर्नमेंट कॉन अफोर्ड टू लूज दिस पीपल सो डिजिटलाइजेशन टू कम टू द पीपल इकोनॉमी हैज टू बी कम टू द पीपल सो द नो गवर्नमेंट कैन अफोर्ड टू लूज दिस काइंड ऑफ अ क्राउड this kind of population for better or for worse some countries have pursued the digital transformation from the top down but that's not always the case i want facing free speech limitations and under us embargo cuba has been a holdout from the globe's digital transformation but that may finally be changing. Here in Havana, it was the sheer ingenuity and determination of the people that pushed the government to accept the digital transition. Los cubanos ciertamente estamos somos conocidos ya en el mundo por nuestra gran capacidad de resolver problemas. Tenemos muchos problemas y estamos constantemente resolviéndolos. Eso es lo que yo llamo the Cuban hacker spirit. The digital revolution began with ever creative Cubans engineering ways to access online content all while living offline. It started with Luwilver's generation. They didn't have a lot of formal training or help. They just wanted to be online. Buscar, no, la forma en internet de convertir eh, cualquier información en un SMS, en un mensaje de texto. Y ya vino después algún que otro cliente que no quería las notificaciones de Gmail. Me dijo, bueno, ¿y por qué tú no me haces notificaciones de Yahoo? Porque mi correo no es Gmail, es Yahoo. Ah, está bien, vamos a hacerlo. Y, y se lo hicimos. Y todo el mundo, todo el mundo lo ve. Meanwhile. Folks like Jose Santiago Rodriguez were building Cuba-based intranet. They couldn't connect with the wider world, but they could connect between computers on the island. Nosotros hemos conformado como se viene siendo como si fuera una red que empezó por por dos o tres personas y se ha convertido en infinidad de personas de muchos municipios que que todo el mundo lo que se busca es una unión conocer a nuevas personas se trata de simular lo que es el internet pero no no llegamos a ser a que sea internet they didn't have a lot of formal training or help they just wanted to be online soy administrador tuve que aprender y tuve que me romper el coco unas cuantas veces porque la primera vez que entré yo oh, hacía de todo y no sabía ni qué hacía but with this push from below, the Cuban government finally opened Wi-Fi parks in 2014. <laughs> and though it's still very expensive for most Cubans, the country has introduced island-wide digital access in 2018, marking perhaps the newest member of our digital economy. Welcome to Coal Country, a place where closing minds signify the end of an old era. I'm from Boone County, West Virginia. Actually, seventh generation coal miner. Um, grandfather, his, you know, his father and so forth, and, you know, my dad, all my uncles are in the coal mines. Right out of high school, 18 years old, I graduated, went straight to work underground. I was making 31.50 an hour. 
I got that when I was like 24, 23 years old, and I was on top of the world. When that layoff came, boy, I tell you, it was, I lost it all. But Mind Minds, a computer coding class geared towards ex miners, believes it can be a bridge to a new era. Heard about the, the coding class. It's trying to call a database function. Was it for sure what I was signing up to? But it was four miners, and I'm like, all right, let's let, let let's check this out. In my class, we had a guy who showed up, thought it was a typing class. He was gonna learn how to type on a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people around here work with their hands, so approach it just like you would if you were gonna be a welder or if you were going to be a uh, pipeliner. They've done Ruby with a little bit of HTML on top of that. Right now, we're introducing JavaScript. JavaScript is extremely powerful, and there's so much you can do with it. This is when, when lights turn on for a lot of people. Once they have a grasp of this, they can go, go and create a single page website, which is all the rage, you know, right now for a lot of places. The hardest part is, is the learning curve. Just wrapping your mind around what you're doing and why you're doing it. Within a week, I was hooked. This pushes me every day to become better. These boot camps are more efficient than school. My old man and my grandfather, you know, they always told me, you know, you need to get paid from your neck up, not your neck down. And I feel like I've finally accomplished that. Right now I am a full stack developer. This is a skill that you have that no one can take from you. No matter where you go, no matter where the company you're working for goes, you have a way to employ yourself in a way that can be lucrative for you and your family. That's a lot of if statements. I would like to see West Virginia blow up for tech because Michael, Michael Bloomberg made the comment that they couldn't teach coal miners to code. You shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Well, I am walking, talking coal miner that can code. These efforts to prepare for the digital economy are familiar around the world, and the training is beginning at younger and younger ages. Welcome to a dusty town, 60 kilometers outside of Buenos Aires. Dario, a businessman, is partnering with local government to bring robot training to low-income families and neighborhoods. A que el país siga produciendo mano de obra a contramano de lo que es la tendencia mundial. Y si no volcamos la tecnología, eh, la educación hacia la tecnología, corremos el riesgo de que nuestra mano de obra no va a estar preparada para la demanda que va a tener el mercado laboral. La idea es que los chicos, eh, muy temprano en su educación, empiecen a familiarizarse y aprender matemáticas, materias tecnológicas, sembrar la primera semilla eh, y, y decirles, miren, esto es matemática, pero es divertido. Queremos que escribe todos los cubos, pero que vaya a la medida exacta, porque hay algunos que chocan y la primera vez nos salió mal. A veces nos equivocamos, pero intentamos. Y eso es lo que importa. ¿Qué pasó? Uy, se pasó. Tal igual, no hizo bien. Se nota la, el entusiasmo que él tiene en lo que es ahora lo que es la robótica. Así que yo sé que a él le va a servir muchísimo eso. Como que ya nacen con, con un chip. Saben mucho. Sí. Eh. A veces nos preguntan cosas o dicen cosas que no sabemos qué responder por sí. preguntas de, de adultos, digamos. De, de Pero en, internet, en bueno, internet. Nos enseñan eso sí. a nosotros. La tecnología tiene dos eh, objetivos muy, muy claros, importantes para, para la educación. La tecnología creo que tiene mucho que ver con trae innovación al aula, trae innovación a los procesos de enseñanza, pero también es la tecnología que van a usar los jóvenes de la provincia de Buenos Aires cuando vayan a trabajar. Y que el día de mañana sea el futuro de él porque él quiere seguir informática y es, es lo que lo va a llevar al futuro. Catorce horas treinta y dos minutos en Buenos Aires.
Ese es el negocio del futuro. Lo que las compañías dicen es, nosotras, ese, ese dato, esa información que vale guita, ¿vale? Eh, claro. Dinero que nosotros vamos, queremos poder vender. Bueno, estas empresas son las únicas capaces de monetizar esos datos, que además nosotros se los damos. Eso no pasa en Internet también. Empezás a buscar algo y a los 10 minutos ya te recomiendan de eso. In the last 20 years, the global economy has been flipped on its head by the advancements of digital technology, and the world is in the middle of a critical transition. There's the good. Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Apple, everybody, we are coming for you. The bad. I really like working here, actually. And the opportunity. A lo mejor de esto sale un nuevo, no sé, Edison. And as the machines get better and better at being machines, we must find a way to get better and better at being human. That's the challenge in our digital world.